Hello and welcome to episode number 542 of Smart Podcast Trashy Books. I'm Sarah Wendell and today Shana and Maya are joining me to talk about the books that rocked their world. And because Shana was reading Sarisha Glass's The Love Con, we take a nice detour into what we would do if we were in charge of some reality television shows. From the Bake Off to Project Runway, we have some thoughts. Thank you to Maya and Shayna. Do not worry. All of the books we talk about will be in the show notes at smartpitchestrashybooks.com slash podcast. Hello and thank you to our Patreon community. Joining the Patreon brings you bonus episodes, a wonderful, warm and welcoming discord and the opportunity to take part in episodes like these. If you would like to have a look, go to patreon.com slash smartpitches. Monthly pledges start at $1 and every pledge keeps us going. This episode is brought to you in part by You Can Hide by Rebecca Zanetti. This follow-up to You Can Run is the second installment in the Laurel Snow series, which focuses on serial killers and a very chilling question. What if someone you love is a killer? Described as the profiler meets justified meets the blacklist, You Can Hide features Laurel Snow, an FBI profiler who learns she has a half-sister, Abigail, and suspects that Abigail is behind their father's mysterious disappearance. When Abigail claims that someone is trying to kill her, Laurel struggles between protection and investigation, especially when she comes into contact with Huck Rivers, a fish and wildlife captain. Perfect for fans of Lisa Jackson and Karen Robards, You Can Hide by Rebecca Zanetti is available now wherever books are sold. Find out more at kensingtonbooks.com. This episode is brought to you in part by Athletic Greens. I tried AG1 because I like having a nutritional drink, especially when I'm short on time or traveling and off my normal eating schedule. AG1 is powerful because it's so easy. I take AG1 after a workout or after a walk, and it feels very good to know I'm making sure I have all the vitamins I need. AG1 is a daily habit with excellent benefits. You can mix it with ice water, or sometimes I mix it with yogurt or toss it into a smoothie to boost my nutrition in one step. Why take a bunch of different things when you can just mix one scoop of powder once a day? It's the healthiest thing you can do in under a minute. AG1 has been part of millions of mornings since 2010, and it was designed with ease in mind. In fact, it's delivered every month, which makes it incredibly convenient since, as you know, I never know what day or time it is. With AG1, taking good care of my body each day is really, really simple. If you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash Sarah. That's athleticgreens.com slash Sarah. Check it out. All right. Are you ready for books, Rex, and reality TV? On with my conversation with Shayna and Maya. My name is Maya. I live in Los Angeles and I am a lawyer um, today. I'm like ready and willing to quit sort of, you know, <laughs> every week I'm like, is this my last week? Um, and so, yeah, I'm an attorney. I'm Shana and I'm also in California. I'm a social work graduate student and I am a social justice consultant. And I like both of those things, but that was a hard one <laughs> shift because this time last year, I could not have said that. <laughs> so what's different this year? Well, you know, I left my nonprofit job that fit all the stereotypes and things that are annoying about nonprofit jobs. And I started grad school just a few months ago and I started consulting. So then I just get to work with people I want to work with. <laughs> It's amazing. <laughs> That's fabulous. Congratulations. Yeah. I worked in many, many nonprofits before my last job, before I uh, quit. Nonprofits are a special kind of dysfunction, aren't they? I have a lot of love, but, you know, as a consultant, then you just get to support people. Like you come in, you're like, here's another way of being. You like, get really excited. You help them like do what they want to do and be better, hopefully. And then you leave so that if they don't do it, you're not emotionally invested in that. Yep. You're doing something else. <laughs> you are done. Yeah, I worked at one of those nonprofits where there was an entire core of volunteers who were the leadership. And so you had staff who were paid and then volunteers who were like assigned to each division. And they're volunteers. So you can't like really tell them what to do. But some of them have absolutely no expertise in the divisions in which they were put. 
But you had to listen to them because they were the volunteers and they were in charge. It was not a good system. It's the same reason I dislike the idea of like CEOs of nonprofit not taking a salary. Right? First of all, that's that sends so many complicated messages that are deeply disrespectful to your staff. But anyway, enough about nonprofit nonsense. Okay, Shana. I was about to dig into that. Yeah, right. Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. I would love to hear your take on this because, you know, my my in-laws I mean, came from the same nonprofit world and they're like, what do you mean? It was great. And I was like, are you high? Like who can do that job? The kind of people who can do a job where you don't get paid are the kind of people you don't want usually. Like running <laughs> your nonprofit. Nope. If you have the amount of privilege or family wealth or you married an oil baron, like is that really the person who's necessarily going to have the most information and knowledge about the work of your nonprofit? Unlikely, unless the job is to dismantle the like fossil fuel system. <clears throat> I, I get the idea of having very high placed executives and nonprofits who have these social connections with which to fundraise. Like I understand the value of that. Although, of course, that sets up the idea that wealthy altruism is the source of our social network in America, which is not great. No. And yet the foundation of so many historical romances. Oh, my God. I never thought of that. But you're so right. Oh, my goodness. Oh, no, I just made it sad to read your problematic faves again. <laughs> oh, I was already sad. I have a real hard time with heart with I have a really hard time with with historicals right now. I mean, certain historicals, specifically the Regency. Like I can't I can't visit there for a little while. No, we're going to we're, yeah. we're going we're to leave that. Be. <laughs> All right. So, Shana, what are your holiday wishes for everyone? Uh, well, my holiday wishes are that people get the book that they want for the holiday of their choice, that they have the time to read it and no one bothers them and a delicious hot drink of their choice while they're reading and a book that has an emotionally satisfying ending and definitely not a cliffhanger. I love not getting a cliffhanger. Thank you. Yep. Maya, what about you? What are your holiday wishes for everyone? Healthy boundaries. Oh, I love those. <laughs> Being able, because holiday time is like a lot of togetherness. And some of us are very aggressive introverts who just, and like very happily an introvert that needs like peace and quiet. And that is sometimes hard to get during the holidays. And so I hope everyone can like get the uh, amount of time that they need with family and then the amount of time they need without family because that's how you have a really great holiday is how I feel about it. Oh, gosh. Healthy boundaries. Healthy yeah. boundaries are very important. I agree with you. So what is a book that made you really happy this year? Maya, let's start with you. The Heretic Royal by G.A. Aiken. Oh, Yay. that's such a good choice. <laughs> it comes out at the end of December. Um, but it's always beautiful chaos with those books. And like, you know people getting murdered that totally have it coming. And so I just love uh, all of it. And this book, the like love interest is this centaur who is the grudge holder for his, his clan. And I identify very deeply with like that sort of like holding grudges for, in his case, for his people for like thousands of years. Um, and so I just like loved it. Like it was just like, yes. Am I my people's grudge holder? I might be. I kind of want to be that now. Um, but yeah, so, you know, G.A. Aiken all the time. I love the idea of codifying the grudge holder as a role in a society. Yeah. Love it. Like, I just I, like, was sick and it, it was in there and I was like, of course. My mind is blown. Of course. Yes. Of course, you always need that one friend in the friend group who's like, does, is this person? Yes, that person is trash. Let me give you a chapter and verse history of what they are trash for. Yeah, absolutely. When I worked in local politics, oh, God. city council and in Baltimore, I was the grudge holder for the office. Like I, that was my job <laughs> was to be like, this is my list. And these people do not get what they want. And I was also like his scheduler, right? So like being the grudge holder was actually, I was perfectly placed to be the, <laughs> to be the grudge holder because it was like people had to go past me to see um, the elected. And so um, so I was at one point, that was part of my job was to be the grudge holder. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> I, I love that. It. 
That yeah. is such an important skill too. And it's not a skill I have. So I feel like it's so important to have that like in your circle and in your squad because I'll forget. I'll be like, oh, maybe that wasn't that bad what that person did. And you really need the grudge keeper to say, no. No. We don't talk to them. <laughs> no. They were harmful to you. We don't let you. them in. Yeah. <laughs> you're lucky I haven't burnt their car. <laughs> yeah. Like, you're just lucky that if they're just a name on a list on the wall yep. that is like code names, they're just lucky that that is who they are. That's what we had in my office. <laughs> we had a list of code names on the wall of people would walk by and they'd be like, what's that about? And I was like, don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about that. <laughs> you don't need to know. <laughs> I don't always remember the specifics. But I always remember the feeling like, oh, yeah. you're you're giving me a not good feeling. Did we have a problem? And I can't ask them. Like, are you a tool? Is that why I think you're a tool right now? Are you actually a tool or am I just having a bad day? But whoever it is that I know in that group, that they're like, no, 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 no. That person, that person is very, very wrong for many, many reasons. It's a very important role. Yeah. Especially yeah, with asking, like, do I hate you? Because I would be really curious how people respond to that. I'm sorry, I'm not getting a good vibe for you. Are you a schmuck or am I a schmuck? <laughs> Maybe it's me. It could be me. I also love that G.A. Aiken with this series is basically demonstrating how much better Game of Thrones could have been. I mean, oh, and she yeah. ties in her like previous series. So like it becomes a very explicit like tie in to the, the dragon series she had. And I was just so excited that everybody got to come back that I then immediately started over <laughs> the beginning of the Dragon series. So I was like, we're hanging out with these folks again. Like, I need to get reacquainted. Um, happily so. My library has all the books. So, you know, I just get to read them all over again. And so, yeah, it was great to be like, yay. It's like, Animal the Bloody is back. She likes to read books. And then she's always covered in the blood of her enemies. Like, those are two things I identify very deeply with. And so it's just, it's been, I just really enjoyed that book that it came out and I was like, oh, it's here. I'm so excited. Yeah, so good. What a good recommendation, especially because books that are released at the end of the year, they count as the current year's books, but they don't get a lot of attention because everyone's looking ahead or looking at the big, the big holiday book. That is such a great rec. And I can't read a lot of this series because I can't put too much violence in my brain at the moment. But when I am in the mood for absolute, like, limb to limb, just tearing apart destruction, I love G.A. Aiken's books for that. Especially yes. because the people who need to get it, get it. Yeah. It's very satisfying. Yeah, there's no moral conflict there. You're like, absolutely, please rip their lungs out. I would really like that to happen now. And the, then it happens and everything's amazing. <laughs> the dragon ate the bad guy? Oh, that's hot. <laughs> yeah. Shayna, what about you? What is a book that rocked your world this year? Uh, well, it's funny that you mentioned books that come out at the end of the year, because I think that for me, it was The Love Con by Cerecia Glass, which came out in December 2021. But I, you know, with all the holiday stuff, missed it. And I didn't read it until this year. But I loved it. Like, it's a contemporary romance. It's about cosplay, which I love. And it's a reality show setting. And I also love reading about reality shows. I think even more than watching them. Really? Because I feel like the reality shows and romances are usually like what I wish was on television. So like this one, the show is called Cosplay or No Way, I think. And it's kind of like Project Runway, but for cosplay. And what I would watch show. the show. <laughs> I don't even like reality TV and I would watch the shit out of that. Right? right? There's a like glue gun, gun drama that, like, <laughs> that happens. Like, it's fun. And the show kind of, or the, the book starts like near the finale. So like the, it's very much like Project Runway where the characters go home and have to make the last like uh, project at home. So there's a, you get to kind of see the drama with their own lives and the main character, Kenya, is just, like, such a lovely character. She knows she's really good at it. She's a fat Black woman who is very, like, intentional about understanding how she's treated on the show and, like, how she's represented and villainized on the show. So there's a lot of, like, critique about, you know, how Black women are treated on reality television that's just kind of, like, woven through in this, like, 
smart, fun way, you know, because she is so self-aware of it. Um, And she ends up doing a fake relationship because she feels the pressure from the evil judge. There's always that one judge (laughs) who, you know, makes comments about like, you know, her size and how she probably couldn't date anyone. And so she says that she has a partner, but it is back to her best friend. So then she has to go home and have a fake relationship with him while they're being filmed for the cameras. And of course it's fine because he's in love with her and has been this whole time. And it's just, they're so cute and he's adorable. And then they make costumes and yeah, I love it. It made me really happy. I love that. Isn't it great though, when you read a book and you know, oh, this author is deeply fluent in this world and also sees all of the things that are wrong with it. Totally. You could really tell that like, this is a lifetime of like analyzing reality TV shows, which I do too. So I felt so seen. Um, yeah, it was great. And I listened to it on audiobook, Ooh. which the, and the audiobook narrator was on point. Really? Like, really good. And I don't, mm-hmm. I'm not a great audiobook listener. I often like get frustrated halfway through and I'll just pick up the book and reread the rest. Oh, it was read by Zenzi Williams. Oh, they're so good. Oh, They're really? so good. Yes. But they did uh, Denise Williams' Missed Connection and a couple other audiobooks that are really, really good. Yeah. Sensi Williams is awesome. Yes. Oh, yeah. I listened to Missed Connection. That was good, too. Mm-hmm. So, yes. There you go. Great. Well, oh, that's fabulous. I need just to follow everything that Sensi Williams narrates, I guess. Is, is so if you had to pick the reality show that you would most want to influence, like if you are now in charge of a show, which one would it be? Oh my goodness. That's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be in charge of Bake Off. Oh, oh my goodness. The things you could do, like, especially about the Eurocentrism on that show. Oh my dear and the way God. They won't pronounce anything like correctly that's not in English. And I'm sorry, this is your fantasy, but I've already said it. <laughs> no, please join me. I think it's more than a one person job, and certainly additional perspectives are needed on that show. Uh, <laughs> I I was so I was so offended by Mexico Week. Oh my god! I was so mad. I was like <laughs> peeling the avocado. <laughs> oh, and 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 just okay. First of all, so many of the things were not actually baking. Let's just start there. Tacos it is a ba- baking is in the title for God's sake, but also just the inability to engage with other foods. I was so mad about Mexico week. And I was like, listen, I, I, this is not my fight. I am not Mexican, but I'm so mad about this. How dare you insult our neighbor like that? There are so many pastries. <laughs> like I was, I'm like, you go to a panaderia and it's just magic everywhere. There are so many choices. Oh I my do God. I understand. And it's like, what are you doing? Like if you took 10 minutes and walked inside a panaderia, just sent somebody just like did a like FaceTime, whatever with anyone, like you didn't have to go to Mexico. If you just like go to, go to like, I'm in Los Angeles, right? Like Padre is everywhere and it's amazing. And there's just so many choices. And I didn't understand why they didn't do the time to understand all the choices. Um, Or like even talk about the relationship between like French baking and Mexican baking as a result of colonization so that you could have like, it's in conversation, right? With with the the historical, and you could do all the, you could have that sort of, I mean, I'm assuming they don't want to talk about that narrative of colonization, but like, that's the, it's a really interesting relationship of how those pastries developed and how they've become their own thing and how, uh, how it was influenced by, you know, other cultures. But I just, I was just like, wait, there's so much magic. There's so many good things. And you just like, you missed all the tasty stuff. It's yep. very tasty. You missed it because instead they treated Paul Hollywood as though he was an expert on Mexican baking because he went on vacation in Mexico once. How does that, how does that make any sense? Like, am, am I an expert in Japanese baking because of that time that I ate Japanese donuts? They yes, absolutely you are. Actually, I probably know more about them than Paul Hollywood knows about Mexican food. No kidding. Right? <laughs> the thing that made me the the most angry, like it's this past season had moments that made me deeply angry. And then also there was a moment where I was like crying. I was so excited because of what they had managed to do. So the thing that made me so 
angry was every time they went to Shabira, it was like, wow, your flavors are so exotic. I'm like, you need to stop saying exotic. They're so unusual. Who would have thought chicken satay? Did you know that existed? Who knew? Who would combine those flavors together? Not people all over <laughs> that are not you. I mean, these are people who got blown away by the concept of peanut butter and jelly. So, you know, they're, they're telling on themselves. But yeah. then there was a moment where Janusz was making mm-hmm. a cake and everything he did had queer coloring elements in it. He did like a, a cake that had a rainbow heart through the middle. And on one of his big, big cake bakes, like in later in, this, in the season, spoilers, if you haven't seen it, Janusz does pretty well. Um, <laughs> The, the, he did, uh, I think it was rainbows at the bottom. And then moving up, there was a section that was trans pride color. The, you know, they do that little illustration of it. And the illustration really played up the color. And Matt Lucas actually says very specifically to celebrate transgender rights, black rights, and Asian rights. And I was like, they said transgender on the Bake Off. <laughs> the bar is so low that I cried when they said transgender rights on the bake-off. Like on one hand, that's deeply sad. And on the other hand, I was so glad that 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 whole swath of whoever's watching that show was like, oh yeah, transgender rights are a thing. It's it's a very complicated feeling. You know what I mean? It's like one of those moments when you realize you're not the audience that Mm. they're speaking to because you, like you don't need a cake to remind you (laughs) about those people's rights and it's beautiful and it's lovely, but it's also like, yeah, like, yeah. And so it's just that it's just one of those things when you realize like, oh, we there are audiences that still need to be convinced or reminded or that idea needs to be suggested to them in a way that is palatable and beautiful. Literally palatable. You yeah. Say, right. If you just say uh, we believe in transgender rights, they're going to be like, well, right. But if you say, look at this gorgeous cake and all the pretty colors, they'll be like, oh, my goodness, that's gorgeous. Right. And then you can bring in other ideas. And so it's like one of those moments where you're like, oh, this isn't for me because (laughs) I'm excited about the pretty cake, but I was already there. I didn't need a cake to like get me to there. Um, Yeah. yeah. It is really a moment where I realized that that in Mexico week, I realized I was not the audience for that one either. I I, I went in just like, oh, this is going to hurt my abs from cringing. And I also think it just about the pressure on the contestants too, because you don't know how you're going to be edited, which is like some a big part of the the plot of the love, love con, which is and so I think, scary, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, for queer participants, I feel like you must like you have to make the rainbow cake, right? Because you don't know are they going to like keep the parts where I talk about my partner? Are they going to keep the part where I talk about you know my activism? There's you know all of these shows where you I only find out people are queer when I read about them later. Like mm-hmm. they don't they don't keep that part, you know, no. in the, in the reality show itself, because they can only have like one queer contestant or something. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> they're like, instead you're, you're the college student contestant. We can't mention the queer part. Like, <laughs> we, we can't make it clear that apparently half the bakers are queer. That would be confusing to our audience. That would be so really, that would just one. be alarming. That's just. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. And they're looking for non-complicated representation. Right. And so they want somebody that's like, very clearly queer, right? That they have, that they do these things that are very clearly marking them. They don't want, you know, some like high femme, right? They want somebody who's, who's butch or whatever, because they, they don't want to have to explain over and over again, or like even deliver a complicated message in terms of, uh, of like what it means to be and perform queerness, right? And so I think that's also it feels, I know it feels rough for me to be like, I am this person and I have to perform this in a very specific way, or it's going to get totally erased by this, by this medium that is not interested in my complicated identity. I mean, there's many reasons why reality TV freaks me out, but that would be a reason why it's like, if you're not allowed to be a whole person, you're not allowed to be a complicated person. You have to be somebody that fits within a storyline they're trying to develop. And that often means flattening out all the things that make people really interesting and complex and you know whole people (laughs) so um yeah I I would be as like if I was a queer person I'd be really worried about the way they might erase me to like fit whatever normative expectations of performing queerness I remember after the show ended Janusz did a post on his Instagram about how each week he deliberately wore a different color of the rainbow so that at the end he could do a series of himself and I was like this guy was like I'm going to queer code. 
<laughs> I'm going to queer subtext. I'm going to queer text. I'm just going to queer my cakes. I'm going to queer my clothes. Like there was no stopping him. And like you said, it's so easy, especially because the editorial decisions and the creation of the reality show character that is a part of you is is in the hands of the producers. It's not in your hands. Like one of the weird things about this past season was that one of the finalists was hardly ever on camera and not even in the contestants know why that is. Ooh. Like he was hardly on camera. Like everyone's like, who is that guy? He was never, he was never featured. There was not a lot of talk about him. I think you'd be very good if you were in charge of Bake Off, Shayna. But I didn't need to mean to give you an answer. If you have a show you'd like <laughs> to take over, I am all ears. I also think you could do marvelous things with Fuckboy Island. Oh my goodness, I sure could. <laughs> <laughs> um, although I love that show. Like that show, as as written, has, has like a lot of appeal and entertaining things. I don't know how to choose. I actually might choose Project Runway because I feel like it's a grand dame. It's been there for so long. And other shows like you know, The Amazing Race or um, Top Chef, have like gotten better at representation over time and were similarly terrible like, like at the beginning. Um, Top Chef particularly, I feel like has become much more politically aware around like the politics of food and race and representation in the industry, although really still needs to work on gender. But I just feel like Project Runway just, it's like it's trapped in amber. Like it just struggles with that. And there's, you know, so much classism in the industry and in the language that the judges use to, you know, talk about the work, yeah. like that you, oh, it looks so expensive, you know, or like that looks really trashy. And, you know, there's just so much embedded classism in that, um, which doesn't make any sense given like, you know, street fashion culture and how important that is to drive it. And uh, yeah, just the way that they kind of talk about race and culture on that show it just feels like it has not moved forward <laughs> you know, at all and I disagree with who wins almost all the time <laughs> like so so if nothing that's else that's why I need time. to take over <laughs> like I disagree um yeah I mean there's just a lot of interesting things that, that are happening in fashion and like dynamics around size also oh yeah like, some of the best episodes are the fun ones where they bring in like non-models and they're forced to make clothes for people of different shapes and they like fall apart <laughs> like like there's always the man who's like I can't handle breasts like I don't know what to do with them <laughs> and you know those are really I feel episodes. you sir like, <laughs> <laughs> I feel that way too like, you know it is hard it's hard for us too but we somehow managed to clothe ourselves and not in a sack yeah. so <laughs> you too could manage that yeah, I just think there's like a lot to do to really decolonize Project One Way and to like celebrate creative ingenuity. Um, and it's and it's not just about like casting more people of color. It's like actually the problems are with the challenges and the judges and really with like inherently what people think is good in fashion and who gets to decide that. And, you know, who gets to decide like what taste is because they're often talking about like Dilker Tree particularly working class contestants like I'm questioning your taste level like you know they'll say that what does that really mean what it means is that this like appears too poor for me or you know they'll question like who did you make this for I can't understand your client and I'll be watching it thinking oh my god I would wear that <laughs> please make it for me <laughs> but they have such a limited understanding of what your client could be and even though they have had some great guest judges and, you know, it's just, they really need a revamp on that show. And then they peeled an avocado with a vegetable peeler. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the same problem, isn't it? Right. It's a very limited vision of audience and they don't realize how many people they are leaving out of their directive. I do have a recommendation for you. You might have seen us talking about this in the Slack. If you have HBO Max, The Big Brunch is so good. So it is Dan Levy from Schitt's Creek, who used mm -hmm. to host the Great Canadian Bake Off. He did two seasons. And it's like, as Tara put it, it's like he took everything from the Great Canadian Bake Off that was good and brought it to his own reality cooking show. So he is a judge, Sola from 
uh, bon, formerly of Bon Appetit, the one who blew the lid off of how racist Bon Appetit was. She's a judge. She's incredibly good. And then the gentleman, I can't remember his name, but he was the owner and operator of 11 Madison Park and some really high-end restaurants, but he's delightful. He's also married to Christina Tosi, so he knows brunch. But the, the three of them are so kind. The contestants are so queer and so inclusive. And they they created, like, they just they decided that they were going to do family meal before the show starts. My favorite thing was the last episode that I watched last night. They were doing a team competition. Um, and Dan Levy is the producer and the host. Like, it's very, very clearly his vision. And the team challenges was were set up where they had the captains based on who was best in brunch last week and then who won the first challenge that episode. And so they were the team captains. And Dan was like, okay, so you know what this is not? This is not gym class. You're not picking. You're going to draw names from a hat because I don't do gym class. And I was like, oh my God, I was actually nervous about watching them select the other contestants. And they just drew names out of a hat and figured out how to work together. I'm like, that's that's what I like. That's what I like right there. Just thoughtfulness and kindness. It's very, very good. You might really like it. Well, I have so far, I think, liked every reality show you have suggested. Which is weird because I am not a reality show connoisseur, but then I'm like, oh, Shayna would like this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just have Shayna and like I have a, a, a Shayna vibration. Like, oh, that's a Shayna thing. And it'll be really different. You'll, you know, you'll suggest it's, it's, rich people in London. Shana, you'll like this and then oh, you'll be right. <laughs> ladies in London, wasn't that some just some vintage nonsense? I can't believe how deeply invested I got in the nonsense so Maya, quickly. It was like real housewives of snobby English people. And then they threw in an American. No, there were two Americans at one point. They threw yeah, Americans. Two, uh-huh. They didn't like each other. And I don't, I, I find real housewives unwatchable. Yet I found this like so entertaining. <laughs> Maybe because it's like anthropological. They're it's, fighting over Thanksgiving, like the very beginning. Like the first episode, I thought, what is Sarah talking about? I don't know. And then by the end of the episode, I'm like, who should get to host Thanksgiving? Right. Which of these Americans do I support in hosting Thanksgiving and introducing it to these British people? Yeah. I cared a lot. It was very strange. I don't know if it's like a Stockholm Syndrome situation. but It was, it's wild. Everyone had their dark side and every. Everyone had something actually I liked about them. Even the woman who made like weird like yoga nut balls for people to eat. That was her business. Like and she, <laughs> every time she would talk about like selling balls, like <laughs> the 12 year old me just <laughs> would start giggling. <laughs> but she took it so seriously. She would bike around town with her balls. Oh, yeah. She was way into it. All right. So what? was a win for you in 2022, Shana? Well, it's funny because it kind of piggybacks on what Maya said. I think it was setting boundaries. Yay, boundaries! <laughs> Congratulations. Yay, yes. <laughs> it's, it's so it's, hard. Right? Oh my goodness, it's so hard. <laughs> I'm such a people pleaser, so it does not come innately to me, but I feel like I really am starting to get good about it. And also, like, not feeling guilty. Because to me, that was the battle. Like, it's not just setting the boundary, but it's like not feeling terrible about setting the boundary, but instead feeling great about it. So no is a complete sentence. It's great to say. Oh, it really is. And it's the guilt part that's the thing that's the most deeply conditioned, isn't it? Like, if you set a boundary and it's inconvenient for me, then then you have done something wrong. Yep. Exactly. And then I, you know, you feel like you're a terrible person. But the thing is, like, when you fill your life with things that you don't really want to do, then there's no room for the things that you actually want to do. Yeah, absolutely true. You know, like one example is that I don't read books that I don't want to read, even if people gave them to me as a gift. And that was very hard. Because <laughs> sometimes people will ask you how you enjoyed the book that they gave you. And it doesn't mean that I have to read it. Nope. The Which obligation, the, the obligation ends when the gift exchanges hands. A gift that comes with an obligation is not a gift. And instead of just sitting the gift in my house for years until I finally get rid of it, now I immediately let it go. Oh. So it, does, it doesn't have to live here anymore. And it gets it to find somebody to who else. will like it. Hopefully. Yeah. And if not, I don't have to care. No. <laughs> That reminds me of one of the other guests on my end of the year episodes. Sue said, I don't make myself 
finished books. If I don't like it, I'm not going to just rage read it and then text all my friends. If I don't like it, I'm going to move on, even if I don't finish it. And I'm, that's a really hard conditioning to undo. It is. And I've had um, a lot of group projects, you know, now that I'm back in grad school. I'm sorry. So that I, I know, but they've been great. And I realized that, is it that I hate group projects or that the way I was participating in them meant I was constantly resentful because my needs weren't being met because I would try to set a boundary, then people wouldn't follow it. And so then I would fall back and not hold them accountable to that boundary. And now I just don't do that. Like if I'm not going to work on something on the weekends, then I just don't. And it's amazing because then people step in, like when you don't let yourself be a doormat. So I've, I've really enjoyed all of our group projects. And if you had asked undergraduate Shana that, like I would never believe it. It was always the worst. Oh my God. <laughs> I can just hear my kids now because they're both in high school groaning about group projects. Like, <laughs> That's a great win. Way to go. Thanks. I hope that makes grad school a lot easier overall. So far, so good. We'll see how my next semester goes. (laughs) Maya, what about you? What was a win for you in 2022? So uh, during COVID, I did nothing. Um, Like no exercise, no movement. Um, And so that was at the time a win for me. I love not leaving my house was so great. But um, a thing I used to do um, for more than 15 years was I was a dancer and then I hurt myself pretty badly and was not able to do that type of movement anymore. And so this year I started doing aerial dance. Um, And so I've been loving it. I had no upper body strength and I am like almost at being able to do a pull up. And so but like with aerial dance, it's like a pull up, but you're upside down, right? It's like a pull up, but you're in the splits, right? It's always these crazy pull ups. And so I've just been loving um, being able to dance and getting strong again and um, accepting the fact that perhaps I should leave my house with some regularity. Um, and so <laughs> that has been, that's what I've been doing that I'm really excited about getting started this year. I love that so much. It looks so fun. Whenever I've seen videos of people on YouTube doing aerial dance, it looks so fun. It's so fun. You get lots of bruises and fabric burn. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Well, there is chafing. (laughs) Yeah, I just had like this fabric burn that was that's been healing. And it's always like under the armpit, right? So it's like a very tender place already. Or I have these like, yeah, weird bruises on my legs from uh, from drops or whatever. And so, yeah, it's, uh, it's really great. Um, and it's really nice, like being able to tell how much stronger you're getting, you know, cause it's like one day you can't do a thing. And then the next day you like can do a thing and you're like, Oh my God, it's like happening. I can see the progression. Right. Cause it's sometimes hard if you're in school or if you're just like out here living life, you can't see like change, you can't yeah. see yourself getting better. And so aerial dance, going from having no muscles <laughs> to having some amount of muscles has been really fun. That is so awesome. I've noticed as I get older, and I think aerial dance would fall into this, I don't want heavy impact, jarring exercise. I don't want to vibrate my bones. Like I don't, I don't want to make my skeleton go, mm, mm, mm. and I also, I started um, going to physical therapy a couple of weeks ago. I actually read a tweet, which is embarrassing, from uh, Tressie McMillan Cottom, which is not embarrassing, that uh, everyone should go to physical therapy because we all carry purses and men's bullshit. And I thought, wait a minute, my back does hurt. Shit, I can do things about that. And the number of people who are in there because they injured themselves from something very high impact and repetitive, I'm like, oh, I am doing right by my body, by doing yoga, by doing stretching, by doing things that aren't high impact. I think aerial dance sounds so cool. It is. And I've actually been doing physical therapy a lot this year because once I started doing movement, my body was like, hey, you have all these old injuries that you've just been ignoring. Like you've just been ignoring your pain, right? And so I started doing physical therapy. And so it's been a whole lot of like, everything hurts. And I need this nice man to like work out all the pain in my back so I can like look to the left again. (laughs) And so um, it's been really, it's been really great, like sort of getting back into my body and being able to really like 
be in there and inhabiting my body and like doing all this movement and stuff that I during COVID did not do. Um, and I loved it. I loved not doing it. And I'm now loving like doing stuff. That's so great. Isn't yeah. physical therapy amazing? So great. I just, every time I'm like, fix it, it hurts. And then you like, there's a lot of working it out and then yep. I can like lift my arm and stuff. <laughs> I have a lot of problems with hypermobility. I'm very flexible. Um, and as I get older, that's really not great. Um, the best thing about doing physical therapy, there's two parts that I love. One, at the end, they put a TENS device on my back and then they put a heating pad on top of that. And they're like, okay, just lie there and relax. And I'm like, sure, not a problem. Happy to help you. No, I, how long? 15, 20 minutes? Two hours? Sounds great. The other thing is that when I've been going, World Cup games have been on. And so they put the World Cup games. Y'all want to watch the World Cup with physical therapists. You want to watch the World Cup with physical therapists because when it's when it's like a, a floppy foul, they're like, yeah, that guy didn't do anything. That that guy's that guy's limbs were fine. Like they all look and they go, hmm. Then when there is an injury, they all go, oh God, don't, don't look. No, 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 don't look at the screen. Oh, they're replaying it. Like they, 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 they're like, oh, it's so bad. Oh, he just, t and then they'll tell you what happened and what got injured. I mean, it's great. Their insight into the World Cup is fantastic. It's such a great way to watch. Like if you can find a bunch of physical therapists to watch soccer with or football, if you're not American, highly recommend. <laughs> <laughs> Your wins were both boundaries and freedom like body, freedom in your body. Those are such good things. Thank you so much for doing this. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm excited about all of our wins, especially because now I can pretend like I have a friend in the circus, which is how I'll be referring to Maya for now on. <laughs> yep, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so, so much for doing this. I absolutely love doing these episodes and I'm so excited to share this with everybody, especially our thoughts on reality TV. I have a, I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of thoughts on what reality show we should renovate next. Yeah, I look forward to being hired to run a reality show now once, you know, they hear our amazing ideas. We would do a good job on that. We really we, would. You could create like an alternative to The Bachelor that, you know, wasn't terrible. If anyone could do it, I trust Smart Bitches could. Thank you guys so much for doing this. This has been delightful. Let's hang yeah. out again new, in the new year. Anytime. It's great to get to see both of you. Yes. Absolutely. And that brings us to the end of this week's episode. I am curious if you have thoughts of what you would do if you were in charge of a particular reality show. You know how to get in contact with me, but I will tell you anyway. You can go to Sarah at smartbitchestrashybooks.com and you can email me your thoughts. You can also record a voice memo and email it to me and then I'll include it in a future episode. Or, you know, just leave a comment on the on the uh, entry at Smart Pitches and tell me, what, what would you do? What are you going to fix? How are you going to make things much, much better? As always, I end with an absolutely dreadful joke. This joke comes from Clay in the jokes channel of the Smart Podcast Trashy Books Discord. This is perfect for this week. Are you ready? Share this with all of your family. What's a holiday tree's favorite candy? Give up? What's a holiday tree's favorite candy? Ornaments. <laughs> Thank you, Clay. On behalf of everyone here, we wish you the very best of reading and a wonderful holiday weekend with whatever you are celebrating. We will be back here next week. But until then, have fun. Be safe. Set boundaries. Smart Podcast Trashy Books is part of the Frolic Podcasting Network. You can find outstanding podcasts to subscribe to at frolic.media slash podcasts. <laughs>